we're talking about innovation. We say, gee, there's three in this market space. It does this. We're actually going to do one better. We're going to do something that nobody ever did before, yeah. and we're going to change what the market is. Now you're not just talking about invention. You're talking about innovation. They're all invention. Getting into a product or a service or a new concept to have it has to be an invention in that sense, but it's innovation when you change the real bottom line of what's going on. The relationship between market and innovation, obviously we're talking about in a commercial sense here, uh, that it do, a, a market doesn't exist until frequently innovation already happens. We can ask people what they think they want, and then actually what they do want is something quite different. Uh, I have to tell you that, oh, I guess it was the the early 90s, they, they went and they interviewed a whole bunch of people, HP did, and said, if we had a cheap color printer for you, you know, would that really be something you want? And everybody went, nah, not really. And uh, what nobody counted on was the fact that the World Wide Web would come along, 95, 96, 97, certainly by 2000, and we had color screens, and oh my goodness, you know, we really want to print those out. Suddenly, everybody wanted them. If HP had listened to what people wanted, then they would have, you know, they wouldn't have had a business there, and that's a huge part of their business. So that we have to understand that markets aren't some law of nature, some law of physics. This is the way it has to be. Markets are frequently created by innovation, and we see that in a number of strategies. Intel went around 20 years ago, and Andy Grove, when he was president, invested in a whole lot of small startups. They never bought more than a third. So they never have a controlling interest, but they say, here's some money, we got a third of you, so we get some proprietary right here. Now go be as creative as you can, because he, kn he knew that they were creating more and more uh, uh, very uh, nifty computers with lots of processing and lots of screens and all that stuff was happening, but no applications. So he seeded the market by seeding people doing innovation, so when they got there, you'd buy their machines. And so the market is something that we frequently create as opposed to dictating where the innovation needs to go. Well, I like to answer the question to say, how important is it that they understand innovation? Because they're writing policy uh, about how information is. And a, and, a, and a great example would be like airbags and cars. We wrote a policy that said we really want safety, so we're legislating that from a regulatory standpoint, uh, cars by such and such a date are going to have airbags in it. Well, this is the nature of technology. Number one, there hadn't been enough airbags built to understand that uh, we didn't understand everything about them, so that they would harm uh, very small children and people who were you know, very weak or, or disabled. Nobody knew that, and yet that's what's legislated to understand how innovation works and understand that innovation doesn't dictate a solution but goes along a, a continuing line of improvement. They needed to say, you need to be at least as safe as. And then the solution might have been a technology of the airbag or it might have been another technology. So it's important to understand that once you, you throw it out there, then innovation chases that goal. And that's one of the things with policy. I think another aspect of that is to understand that there's a, a lot, even if you achieve that, you have a problem. Uh, we had that with the export of computer products and computer chips, saying, well, it can't be any more than this, so you have to be able to make sure that it couldn't run a nuclear plant. You know, it's like your laptop can run a nuclear plant these days. <laughs> it's like we have to understand that fact um, that many of these lines and thresholds move. So you have to understand the nature of innovation that once we're after something, it's just going to continue to innovate. So that's a really important issue that if you don't understand that, you get focused on the technology and not on the nature of innovation. Well, the first thing you have to understand about Silicon Valley is that it has a whole lot of different kinds of people, a whole lot of different kinds of organizations, not just 
manufacturers and computer people and computer uh, uh, facilities there. It has universities, it has expensive labor and cheap labor. It has all kinds of things going for it, plus lots of people like to come to San Francisco. We just, it's a world-class location, so people, everybody wants to go there. They got a whole big quality of life. Don't mention the real estate, that is not good. But, <laughs> but if you can get into anything, it's fantastic. So you're talking about a whole area that has a whole lot of elements that, that talk about creative, excuse me, that has a whole, have a whole lot of elements that have to do with quality of life and good weather and, and also have this ability of all kinds of people and all kinds of things happening. So every time somebody asks me outside of that, how do we become like Silicon Valley? I say, well, it's not impossible. As I said, the real estate's really expensive. Is that a deterrent or is that... Uh, uh, as, as bad as like the weather in Minneapolis is an example. It's like, well, that's a good question. A whole lot of people would rather live in a much better house that's much cheaper in Minneapolis and deal with the weather situation than go to San Francisco and have to deal with the, the in that whole San Francisco Bay Area, the price of real estate. And so no one has a perfect solution. There are no perfect places out there, but you have to be able to have a place that has all of those things contributing. The whole state of Minnesota has a long history of huge innovation when it comes to the computer industry, when it comes to all kinds of things. I, I, I don't have to, to tell you that. And so we do know that the seed and the core is there. What we have to do, whether it's Minnesota or someplace else, is to understand that number one, innovation is free. It's a mindset. It's a way that everybody looks around and says, I can create, I can do, I'm going to make solutions and create solutions, come up with things that didn't exist before. That is the kind of thing that says, as in Silicon Valley, most people work for other companies, but most people see themselves as an entrepreneur. So that if you take everybody in school, all the businesses, all teachers, everybody, if they see themselves as entrepreneurial, even though for the most part they'll be working in an organization, suddenly everything becomes an opportunity for innovation. So when I look at a place like Minnesota, I say, well, what have you got that contributes to full quality of life? What enables you to have a lot of support, whether it's developing in an educational sense, uh, interfacing with a lot of firms, uh, having any kind of access to the to the world, how far, how can, you, how fast can you go to the airport, and how can you get out of here? How can people come in here? How can you engage in the world? And you match that with entrepreneurial mindset and innovation mindset. It's really pretty free. It's not a question of absolutely educating absolutely everybody, but changing the view people have of themselves and where they're going. And that doesn't cost anything. That does take everybody suddenly going in another direction. But that really doesn't cost anything.